so in the last class we saw uh, different steps of image interpretation from you know defining the classific classification system required whether it is a residential commercial industrial buildings etc or employing a minimum mapping unit mmu which is a smallest size size entity to be mapped as a discrete area then you know uh, you know start marking boundaries after fixing these two and then work from general to specific these were the different steps general steps in visual image interpretation so this we saw in the last class we stopped there so uh, you know image preparation and viewing coming to this so uh, we saw how this images are collected what spectral ranges these images are collected uh, how is the flight planning done how are these images collected the end lap overlap and these images are collected then they are uh, you know uh, worked from uh, general to specific afterwards so uh, for this image preparation you know you for preparing for this vis uh, visual image interpretation you collect collateral information as well you know you just by looking at the uh, satellite image you might not be able to uh, interpret it so you have to you might have to collect some collateral information from various sources so like you know sources like uh, maps field reports maybe a site uh, investigation or a site report reconnaissance data or maybe you might have to go to the field and cross check what you are looking at so you might have to collect some collateral information from various sources then the next step is to use a clear overlay for delineation of the area that you have to study or uh, you know uh, if you are using a uh, you know I'll, I'll draw and show that suppose you have a uh, this is your image suppose this is your image you have some features on it this is your image and you might have to you know suppose you are looking at a particular feature on that image particular area on that image suppose this is the area that you are supposed to look at okay so you know you uh, if you are looking at a hard copy you will overlay a clear copy of this area all right this area a clear copy this is your clear copy and this was your satellite image this is your image or a aerial photograph so this is a transparent piece of paper this you will overlay on this so that you will get this area that you are supposed to look at and interpret okay but in the case of a uh, ha, soft copy in the case of a soft copy uh, you might require shape files to do that you know you already created a shape file of our canvas suppose you are looking at our canvas and you are trying to interpret something so uh, you have first you will have to see whether the feature that you are looking at falls within the uh, shape file or shape field uh, falls within the uh, boundary of the region that you are looking at right so either you use a clear overlay if it is a hard copy for delineation of the area to be uh, surveyed or interpreted or if you are looking at a soft copy in a software or so you might use a shape file to uh, delineate your area which is to be interpreted then the next step is to identify effective areas for photo coverage you know we already saw what is side lap and overlap we know that suppose uh, this is my another line and these are the photos that my flight took you know there is some overlap right what is overlap can anyone tell me what is overlap end lap and side lap that is some overlapping end lap and side lap what are they can anyone tell me to a stereo pair will overlap each other right so for some part of the image it will overlap right so that was my end lap then what was side lap so next step is to identify the effective areas for photo coverage so here if you look at this there is a central area on each photo bounded by the lines bisecting the areas of overlap so here you can see suppose uh, let me draw this more so here you can see there is some effective area suppose this region so 
so this is my effective area for photo coverage you know the central area on each photo bounded by lines bisecting the areas of overlap so this is one effective area which i can use this is another effective area because i am pretty sure that this area is completely covered isn't it so this is another effective area right so like this i will ensure that i will identify effective areas for photo coverage so i am pretty sure that i didn't miss any particular region here because this is clearly covered so this is how you identify a effective area for image interpretation all right is that clear so once you do that then you go for the image interpretation equipment where you can view make measurements interpret transfer informations to maps and databases so if you are suppose you are using a uh, hard copy of the photograph you are you you are viewing the images stereoscopically because we always take adjacent photos and then we view it through a stereoscope isn't it we saw that in the previous classes we look at it through a stereoscope we look at it through a stereoscope right so we look at it through we look at adjacent images we look at a, a stereo pair using a stereo uh, gram or a you know stereoscope so this will provide you a 3d view of this terrain and you know there are different types of stereoscopes in use you have lens stereoscopes mirror stereoscopes zoom stereoscopes etc so you uh, view these stereoscopic images one and two here you can see these are these stereoscopic images so you view these stereoscopic images you try to identify some uh, you try to interpret some data from that and then you transfer that data into a base map that you are preparing you will prepare a base map with some features or data on it with all the uh, you know interpreted data from the stereo pair you will transfer onto your base map this is your base map so this is basically the process of visual image interpretation nowadays we don't we are not using these lens stereoscopes or mirror stereoscopes zoom stereoscopes etc because the softwares and technology used for this have developed so very much so we use you know uh, image interpretation softwares we use gis softwares for it basically right you can use ArcGIS, QGIS, GrassGIS. There are n number of GIS softwares which you can use for visual image interpretation. So once you do that, you you are what you are doing is you are may, viewing, making measurements, interpreting the data, and finally transferring that information into a map or a database. You are creating a new base map or a database in GIS which covers all the data that you have interpreted from a stereo pair or maybe a soft copy of an aerial photograph clear moving forward so what are the applications of this why do you have to do this why do you have to obtain these photographs and why do you have to do all this image interpretation based on the you know selection key elimination key and all that we saw how you you know uh, it acts like a legend right selective key elimination key you identify various features you look at uh, the stereo pairs using a stereoscope different types of stereoscopes you use you look at the image you look at a 3d model then uh, you identify a particular features on it maybe you might have to collect the, some data from uh, field observations as well right then what you are doing is you are trying to interpret a particular image but what is the application of doing all this so the, as you as you can see here on this slide i have listed out a few of the applications there are n number of applications the applications for remote sensing and gis are practically endless you can use it for anything and everything so a few of the most widely used applications I am mentioning here. So land use, land cover mapping, geologic and soil mapping, agricultural applications, forestry applications, rangeland applications, water resources application, water pollution detection, lake eutrophication assessment, flood assessment, urban and regional planning applications, wetland mapping, wildlife ecology applications, archaeological applications, environmental assessment, natural disaster assessment, landform identification and evaluation, land use suitability, slope stability issues, seismic hazard assessment. You know, the applications are basically endless. So a few of these uh, we will see in detail. So the, coming to the first one, land use, land cover mapping. So we already know what is land use, land cover mapping because we already saw this in a few uh, discussions and I showed you a land use land cover map that I had prepared for uh, the state of Kerala and all. So we know what it is actually, what it basically means. So land use and land cover are two different 
uh, terms which deals with two different parameters. So what does land cover mean? Land cover or LC. So land cover means the type of feature present on the earth surface. So what is on the earth surface? That is land cover. What is the earth covered with? You can simply you know correlate it with that. What is the earth covered with? Maybe a paddy field, a lake, a forest, a highway. What is a particular piece of land covered with? That is land cover. Type of feature present on the earth surface. That is land cover. Then you have land use. What is that particular piece of land used for? That is human activity or economic functions associated with a specific land area. Maybe it's an urban area. Maybe it's a residential area. So that is how you map land use. What is that particular land used for? Right? So, you know, all these land uses have land cover as well. Right? Uh, it might be a roof. It may be a pavement. It may be grass. It may be trees, etc. It will have land cover. So you generally you call this term land use land cover mapping. So this can also give you rainfall runoff characteristics, right? Because based on the land cover, you know, your rainfall runoff, uh, runoff coefficients estimated can also vary, isn't it? Depending upon the surface, depending upon the land cover, isn't it? So whether it is a roof, whether it is a pavement, whether it is a grass, whether it is trees, whether it is a highway, whether it is a lake, whether it is a paddy field, depending upon what is the particular land cover at a particular site, your you know, rainfall runoff characteristics also will vary. That is just one example that I am giving here. So you can use it for, to estimate your runoff from a particular given area, isn't it? So that is one thing. So land cover, it is easier to interpret than land use. Maybe land use, I, am, I, I have identified the land cover as a built up area. Suppose land cover is built up. built up area is my land cover okay but what is the land use of that built up area that it's a bit more difficult to interpret because the land use the built up area can be you know maybe residential maybe residential maybe a warehouse maybe a warehouse maybe a factory can be anything right so land cover it is easier to interpret than land use Okay, so generally there are several land cover uh, classifications used. A few of them are, you know, built up areas, agricultural lands, wetlands, rangelands, forest land, water, barren land, tundra, uh, perennial snow, etc. These are the general classifications. And in this built up land, suppose as I mentioned here, in this built up, you can have uh, various classifications like residential, residential, roads roadways then suppose in the forest you can have sub classifications right uh, deciduous then evergreen so you can have various classifications like this water here you have water you can classify them into rivers lakes ponds etc right so you know these are the various generalized land cover classifications and if you are doing a land cover application depending upon your particular need suppose you are suppose uh, you are trying to map a particular built up area so maybe you you are looking at a region you are uh, interpreting that image and you are uh, dividing it into various land cover classifications and your focus is on built up land maybe you will focus on uh, three different classifications. Suppose you have three different classifications. You have built up land and you have uh, uh, water and then you have barren land and in that built up land you will go for further classifications like this. So depending upon your area of interest or depending upon the particular application that you are particularly looking at, you can go for various land cover classifications. All right. Coming to geological and soil mapping. There also you have a lot of applications of remote sensing and GIS. So uh, it actually requires a large amount of field exploration and it can be uh, facilitated by remote sensing and GIS because we know uh, geological investigations, soil mapping, soil investigations. You have studied, uh, you know, in your uh, geotechnical engineering course, how field intensive work it is to map uh, a soil profile, isn't it? So that actually require a large amount of field exploration, but it can actually be supplemented or it can be facilitated further by remote sensing and GIS. So basically uh, it was initially used for petroleum exploration. So, you know, they used remote sensing and GIS applications in geologic and soil mapping for petroleum explorations. 
So they these remote sensing and GIS can be used for you know with visual image interpretation of satellite images can be used to identify landforms, rock types, rock structures, you know the folds, faults, joints, etc., and their spatial variation and their relation. And also mineral sources can also be identified. So once you have identified a particular area, suppose you suspect that uh, you know there might be uh, crude oil at a particular site. Uh, maybe uh, you have identified such a location. So now next step is how to access that area of interest. So maybe you can uh, go for a road, maybe a trail, maybe a river, maybe you, your only access is through air. So all these things, you know, suppose I'm relating it with petroleum exploration as of now. Right now, just as just for an example, I'm relating it to petroleum exploration. So looking at all these rock types, rock structures, their spatial relation and all these things, you an experienced uh, you know, uh, person can actually correlate this to presence of crude oil or uh, maybe a mining resource, any mining resource. So once you identify that, the next step is to uh, identify your best possible area access. So that also is possible from, uh, you know, remotely uh, obtained images or uh, satellite data, right? So even uh, considering this, you know, satellite images are better for this. Uh, when compared to aerial photographs why is that why would satellite images be better for uh, you know finding out the area access how will you access a particular area why is satellite images better for that rather than aerial photographs? so the first thing is that they cover a much larger area isn't it satellite images cover much much larger area than a drone photograph isn't it so that is one thing so large area coverage that can show more geological features on the earth right another thing is that they helps analyze various uh, you know multispectral bands which helps in better interpretation the satellite images they operate in you know a large uh, range of bandwidths isn't it you might have seen that when you did the, you did your assignment they operate in various uh, spectral bands multispectral bands they operate in the satellites right so of course you, you know it can capture more data uh, than a uh, photograph that is obtained in a drone from uh, in the visible spectrum right you have much more uh, multi-spectral bands in which data is collected in a satellite image that is another thing then another uh, advantage is that you know the satellite images it will help merge various remote sensing data like uh, you might be able to merge data like the topographic elevation data map data uh, you know all these data can be merged into it right so this all will help in better planning uh, and access of an area of interest right so so satellite images are better for this particular application i mean it is better for most of the applications soil mapping next one so uh, why do you need soil mapping in the first place soil mapping means you are identifying the types of soil at a particular site so why is that important is that relevant is that important to you should soil mapping be done what is the relevance of soil mapping? why should you do that yes soil mapping you know finds its application in several uh, many things you know one is estimating the crop yields you know particular crops grow in particular types of soils right so you can actually map and estimate the crop yield from a particular area if you suppose you identify a particular soil at a particular area and uh, you know you are uh, you know that this particular soil is good for a particular type of crop and what might be the crop yield so you might be able to estimate that right then uh, you can uh, use it for rangeland suitability woodland productivity wildlife habitat conditions developmental and recreational uses for in all these applications soil mapping plays a very important role right so for different land use activities you know you have to identify and understand the suitability of various soil types for various land use activities so for that soil mapping is to be done so you know uh, always you know soil mapping is a, a combined process you always have to go for an air photo or a satellite image interpretation along with some field works as well right just like you used to do geophysical tests, you know, seismic refraction test, electric resistivity test and all you have studied, no? So even after doing the ge these geophysical tests, you might still go for a borelog 
a borehole at a center of that particular site just to make sure that your interpretation is correct, isn't it? Similarly, here also air photo, it has to be interpreted alongside with field works. Then agricultural soil survey maps are also produced based on soil mapping. So, you know, you, you map a particular uh, region for its various soil depths and you can correlate it with identifying which types of crops are suitable for that particular region, right? Now, how do you do this soil mapping? So it is, of course, it is based on something called SRPs, right? What is SRP? Yes, spectral reflectance pattern. So spectral reflectance of pattern of various soils, you know, depend upon various factors like its water content, its texture, surface roughness, presence of iron oxide, presence of organic matter. We already saw this when we studied SRP of soil, isn't it? So depending upon all these uh, factors, the spectral reflectance pattern of soil is going to vary and based on these parameters, you can identify certain types of soil and you can map it. Then also you should also consider the temporal factors when you are mapping soil like temperature, rainfall, soil infiltration, etc. You know, based on the soil permeability, uh, maybe the soil may uh, stay wet for a longer period of time. Maybe uh, torrential rainfall, uh, maybe it will keep the soil wet for a longer period of time. So depending upon the spectral reflectance of pattern of that soil along with the water might be different from the uh, spectral reflectance of that soil when it is in its dry condition, right? So temperature, again, wet soil, it has to uh, get devoid of its water content, right? If you need to identify and uh, clearly correlate it to this SRP of a particular type of soil, right? So all these temporal factors are also very important during soil mapping. Next, coming to agricultural applications. You know, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can use it for crop type classification. You know, specific crops can be identified by their spe spectral response pattern and image texture. So you will be able to identify what type of crops are available at a particular site by looking at a satellite image then you can go for a crop calendar you can provide a you can develop a crop calendar where first you obtain the aerial photograph then you go for crop type classification then you prepare a crop calendar where the expected development status and appearance of a crop during an year is used for identifying and interpreting the crop yields and related data then precision farming or precision crop management is also possible with RS and GIS, where precision crop management, PCM. So it is an information and technology based agricultural management system where you know you identify, analyze and manage site soil, spatial and temporal variability and you will, uh, based on this interpreted data, you uh, fine tune your agricultural activities for optimum profitability, sustainability, environment protection, etc. And coming to forestry applications, you know, timber management and maintenance, improving the existing forest, forest fire monitoring and control, species identification, studying of the harvested areas, assessing the disease and in insect infestation at the, in the particular area, assessing the fire potential, and if there is a, a chance of a fire, what can be a uh, fire suppression activity, you can plan that uh, beforehand, then planning forest roads, obtaining wildlife data, you know, forestry also, your applications are basically endless using remote sensing and GIS. It's coming to water resource applications. So, you know, uh, water resource applications are also, uh, there are many water resource applications for remote sensing and GIS, you know, you can uh, monitor the water quality, uh, quantity of the water can be estimated and you can also find out the geographic distribution of water in a particular area. For a large, vast area, you can map these all these parameters. You can maybe you can estimate the runoff in the case of a heavy rain. Uh, if it rains for such and such duration based on the uh, land cover of uh, land cover, you know, gradient, uh, soil type and its permeability based on all these factors, you might be able to estimate the quantity of water that runs off the surface in a particular period of time, right? then you can uh, monitor water quality. Uh, all these parameters can be uh, figured out using remote sensing and GIS. And uh, as I mentioned, assessing the runoff characteristics, drainage of the particular site, depending upon the type of soil, permeability of the soil, uh, gradient of the site, topography of the site, uh, land cover of the site, all these will contribute to runoff characteristics and drainage. So that can be studied. 
then lake eutrophication assessment uh, you know eutrophication what do you mean by eutrophication lake eutrophication means uh, eutrophic lake means a nutrient rich lake okay basically you use uh, lake eutrophication assessment to describe the water quality okay so a uh, eutrophic uh, lake means a nutrient rich lake means there is a chance for high algal blooms and aquatic weeds you know a lot of vegetation can grow in that water weeds can grow uh, you know uh, aquatic plants can grow in it algal blooms can happen so this is possible in a eutrophic lake condition then there is a trophic state trophic state is where the lake is in a uh, nutritional state then you have the eutrophic state where it is in a nutrient rich state then you have oligotrophic condition where it is low in nutrient high in oxygen and the water will be clear then you know this process of eutrophication it it shows the aging of a lake all right lake eutrophication the eutrophic lake means it's a nutrient rich lake so over a long period longer period of time you know due to human activity you know we throw a lot of stuff in that lake and all so this uh, basically keeps on increasing uh, the nutrient richness of the lake right some waste material that all that you not plastics some organic waste materials if you dump into these lakes and all what happens its nutrient content basically keeps on increasing over a period of time right so once the nutrient content increases what will happen there will be a lot more weeds and algal blooms etc in that lake right once the lot of weeds grow on the lake what will happen it will cover the top surface isn't it it will cover the top surface so that very less um, you know uh, sunlight and all goes into uh, the uh, base of the river and all right then uh, oxygen mixing also uh, drops down so this is this lake eutrophication basically uh, it uh, over a longer period of time it will kill the uh, lake uh, ecosystem right so this lake eutrophication assessment you can actually relate it to the inland water quality so uh, this lake eutrophication eutrophication can be identified based on the different uh, algae that is mapped on the water so different algae you know blue algae is there green algae is there so these different algae they have different spectral reflectance patterns so you can uh, identify and distinguish different algae in this water and you can actually uh, you know estimate the lake eutrophication levels and you can correlate that data to the inland water quality so that is where remote sensing uh, application comes in lake eutrophication and uh, inland water quality assessments all right clear then coming to water pollution detection of course suppose there is an oil spill all right suppose there is an oil spill or there is dye in water you know uh, coloring dye textile dye in water so of course your uh, water's spectral reflectance pattern is going to vary isn't it isn't it suppose you have a river you have a river and uh, there is some uh, dye here you have uh, uh, you are observing this uh, river using a, a satellite image you have processed the image you are obtaining you have obtained you are observing the spectral reflectance pattern at different portions of the river suppose at this point it is different suppose at this point it is different and you know here you might observe clear water and coming to this point you might have seen that there is a lot of uh, you know uh, dyes in there the spectral reflectance pattern is uh, different maybe you have observed that this is the starting point where the lake uh, where the river have started mixing with this dye so you can actually figure out Uh, the level of uh, uh, this uh, pollution and the point where it actually starts in that water body so the point where this discharge of dye or this pollutant it reaches the water body and its dispersion also how it is mixing with water all these parameters also can be figured out using uh, remotely sensed sa processed satellite images then another very important application is in the natural disaster assessment so you can detect monitor and respond to natural disasters uh, so you know various natural disasters you know looking at wildfire severe storms floods volcanic eruptions earthquakes shoreline erosions landslides etc 
so i will you know state one important example here earthquakes because i have done that personally so what we did was we estimated the level of ground shaking suppose i have a map suppose i estimated the level of ground shaking in a particular region and i created contours which represent the intensity of ground shaking okay this was my first step so this is one map layer okay then i created another map layer for the same area after geo referencing the satellite image in the same area i mapped it to various land cover parameters suppose some area was built up area some of it was suppose this is built up suppose this is built up area suppose this is open area suppose this is a water body then i have a, a grassland then i have a uh, suppose i have a forest land so this earthquake then what i did was this is my land use map uh, or land cover map this is my land cover map so this is my second base map so then i what i did was i merged these two maps i overlaid these two i placed this one over this so which one of these land covers is susceptible to earthquake or can cause a disaster water bodies open areas grasslands forest lands or built up when you merge these two this map shows my ground motion intensity during an earthquake okay this is a contour map showing ground motion intensity and this is my land cover map so if i merge these two what can i identify in these suppose i have a built up area here this is also a built up area so if i merge these two maps what will i actually interpret what can i actually interpret from this suppose this blue color is my uh, intensity sorry blue color is my uh, land use and i am uh, overlaying this on this okay this is one land uh, this is one built up area this is one built up area suppose at this area i have possibility of high ground motion intensity this area has possibility of high ground motion this area has possibility of low ground motion suppose what can i interpret from this graph sorry from this image so if you look at this figure if you look at this image you can see that suppose this area is having possibility of high ground motion in case of an earthquake and here you have a particular built up area and here also you have a built up area but here you have uh, low possibility of a high intensity ground motion so what you can correlate here is that you can say that this particular region at the center where the ground motion intensity is high you also have a built up area so in case of an earthquake happens in this area the disaster or the collapse of structures in this built up area is going to be humongous compared to this built up area where the ground motion intensity is comparatively less right so like this i can create vulnerability maps i can create risk maps or vulnerability maps by combining various parameters so one simple example i showed here was earthquakes so similarly for landslide shoreline erosion volcanic eruptions floods uh, storms wildfires for all these various natural disasters you can similarly you can create risk maps or vulnerability maps and based on that you can create a more resilient uh, urban planning or a more resilient community you can develop based on these data Uh, there is uh, something else that i need to mention here uh, there is a disaster monitoring constellation which is a, a combination of five satellites it's called dmc disaster monitoring constellation five satellites it was a joint program by algeria nigeria turkey uk and china for natural disaster assessment right it, uh, this uh, uh, this dmc uh, was already used for mapping uh, campsites for displaced people in the sudan estimating vulnerable population sizes in the algeria etc so just one example that i am mentioning here uh, the dmc uh, constellation which combines of five satellites uh, it was uh, it was a joint program by five different countries next coming to another application urban and uh, regional planning 
So uh, in urban and regional planning, also you have a lot of applications. You can uh, you know formulate government policies and programs uh, based on uh, various uh, for uh, various social, economical, cultural, environmental, natural resources planning criteria and all. So based on for various uh, applications or various uh, criteria uh, like uh, social planning, economical planning, uh, environmental planning, resources planning, etc. For various applications and generating or formulating government policies you know uh, uh, you can use uh, remotely sensed data with the processed data it can be used for land use land cover mapping uh, suppose uh, you are looking at a large area and you have mapped the land use and land cover in that uh, you have a hilly area on one side uh, you have a built up area on the center of this particular area suppose you have a high concentration of population here so the government is looking at where we can expand further so looking at this process satellite image you can say that you know we can expand maybe further towards the foothills of these mountains uh, you know without uh, you know you will consider the environmental impact assessments as well uh, based on all these parameters you know for assessment of all these parameters, you can use this remotely sensed data. So based on all these data, large amount of data and processed uh, data in your GIS databases, you can use it for urban and regional planning. You can the governments can decide where to expand the uh, you know uh, urbanization further, where to go for a uh, landfill site, where to go for a new highway, how to plan a new highway, where to go for a uh, in a special economic zone where to go for a IT path you know all these things you can look at a processed satellite image and all these planning can be done based on this remotely sensed and processed images or the uh, data from the GIS databases also you know you can also go for population estimation uh, population estimation how can you do that suppose you are looking at a particular area you are looking at a particular area uh, you are looking at the satellite image suppose you see a uh, flat a residential flat or maybe a villa or a single storied house you know roughly you can correlate in a single storied house suppose uh, three people are living uh, based on the area and the dimensions of that structure uh, maybe you can correlate in this type of structure there are three members in a villa like this suppose there are seven members in a residential apartment like this suppose there are 50 members so if you are looking at this particular area you have a total of 60 people living in this region so like this you know uh, you know blowing it to a much larger scale you can also use this uh, remotely sensed data interpreted data for population estimation a rough population estimation as well then you can go for house quality housing quality uh, assessments uh, traffic and parking site selection urban change detection for all these you know you have further applications then transportation route location then for uh, for a landfill site selection for a power plant site selection for a commercial site selection for a transmission line location just like i mentioned uh, maybe a special economic zone maybe a new railway track maybe a new it park uh, maybe you want to decide where to further develop your city towards for all these applications you can use remotely sensed data so with that uh, i stop various applications here you know you have Many more applications, I mean, wildlife ecology applications are there, wetland mapping is there, archaeological applications are there, environmental impacts assessments are there. So, you know, the applications are basically endless. I have just handpicked a few applications and I try to discuss that with you. You can read the same things in your textbook, you know, uh, the same applications that I mentioned here, you have to read this in detail in your textbooks. More applications are there, you can brush through that as well, right? I'll stop here.